75 years ago, on February 15, 1946, the ENIAC was unveiled at the University of Pennsylvania Moore School of Engineering. As part of the unveiling ceremonies, the ENIAC staff conducted a demonstration of the machine's capabilities. This presentation is a reconstruction of that demonstration based on research conducted at the University of Pennsylvania Archives and oral histories of the original ENIAC programmers. Without further ado, the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. The first step of our demonstration is to load a number of constants from a punched card. Punched cards are the used for all input and output on the ENIAC. Here we see one of those constants loaded into accumulator 1. The constant is 97,367. Next, we're going to add this number 5,000 times to accumulator 2. The result of these 5,000 additions is 486,835,000. As we saw, the 5,000 additions were performed in one second. To put this into perspective, we're going to slow the machine down by a factor of 1,000, which is roughly the speed of the next fastest machine prior to the ENIAC. Just doing a lot of additions fast may not seem all that impressive for such a large and complex machine. However, it turns out that at the heart of many of the most difficult problems we solve, there are millions of additions and some multiplications and other operations thrown in. The first part of this demonstration is intended to give you some sense of how much can be done with simple operations repeated thousands of times very fast. While this is running, we can see that at five additions per second, this is still quite fast, much faster than we would perform by hand. But if we let this continue, it would take about 17 minutes to complete the 5,000 additions that were done in one second a moment ago. So let's not wait the 17 minutes. Let's turn the clock back up to its normal speed. The next stage of the demo focuses on the multiplier. We start by loading the number 13,975 into the two accumulators that will be multiplied together. We see in this accumulator the product 195,300,625. Next, we'll repeat the multiplication another 499 times, accumulating the results giving 500 times the square of 13,975. This is an interesting situation because the sum of all 500 multiplications is too large to fit into a single 10-digit accumulator. So we've connected two adjacent accumulators together to form a 20-digit accumulator. And in that, we see the result of 97,650,312,500. In this phase of the demo, we are generating a table of the first 100 squares and cubes. The computations are all taking place in these accumulators on the back right of the machine. As you've noticed, the computations are not going continuously, but are synchronized with the output scene in the window in the lower right. The reason for this is that every time a result is computed, the system must wait on the card punch to finish the previous results and be ready before the new results can be printed. The card punch takes six-tenths of a second per card to punch. So the computations here are restricted to that rate. Very little of the time is actually used in the computations. To show this more clearly, we will run the full computation of 100 squares and cubes without punching the output. And that's it, the whole computation. Our next demo is a table of sines and cosines. As you can see, this computation is also throttled by the card punch. It makes heavy use of the multiplier and some of the same accumulators that were used for the squares and cubes. The approach we're taking here is to solve a pair of simple second-order differential equations to get the values of the sine and cosine. We often use differential equations to model the behavior of physical processes. 
However, frequently we can't have exact solutions to these equations. That is, there's no simple equation that describes the travel of an artillery shell in the atmosphere or the fluctuations of the weather. For problems like these, we are forced to resort to dividing the period of time we want to examine into a large number of small bits of time. Then, for each of thousands of time steps, we use the differential equations to tell us how much each parameter of the system changes in that time step. Our final demonstration is a particularly good example of this. We will be simulating the flight of an artillery shell. We know that an object traveling a ballistic trajectory in a vacuum is quite simple to analyze and traces a parabola. However, when we factor in atmospheric drag, especially when the projectile approaches or exceeds the speed of sound, it becomes much more difficult and we don't have a closed form solution. In fact, it was the constant need for these calculations and the time that it took to do them manually that motivated the Army to fund the development of the ENIAC during the war. The particular example we will see here is that of a 105 millimeter shell fired from a gun at a speed of 1550 feet per second with the barrel elevated at an angle of 22 and a half degrees. We simulate the motion in time steps of one one hundredth of a second. For every 100 time steps, that is every second of simulated time, we will punch a card that shows the X and the Y coordinates of the shell. The simulation will stop as soon as we've punched a card where the altitude of the shell is negative, representing the shell hitting the ground. Though only minimally visible in the simulation, the drag function is dialed into one of the portable function tables and is used in each time step to determine how much the air resistance slows the shell. We can see in the simulation that it makes very heavy use of the multiplier and a significant number of the accumulators. In the output at the bottom of the screen, we have the time step and the x and y values of the path. The altitude increased until we reached the apogee when the shell began falling back to the ground it hit that maximum altitude at about 3,400 feet. Now that the shell has hit the ground, we see that it traveled a little over 26,000 feet, or about five miles. As shown in the output, the shell hit the ground during the 29th second of flight. Although the shell took about 30 seconds to travel from the gun to the target, the simulation only took about 20 seconds to complete. In other words, the ENIAC simulated the trajectory of this shell faster than the actual shell flew. This graph shows the path traveled by the shell. In keeping with the time frame of 1946, we have drawn this by hand rather than using a computer to draw that path. In this demonstration, I've shown you a variety of the capabilities of the ENIAC, that it can perform 5,000 additions per second, 500 multiplications per second. They can read values from tables, can carry out repeated operations, and can carry out conditional operations. These capabilities make the ENIAC the most powerful computing instrument in the world in 1946, and it continued in operation until its retirement in 1955. I hope you found this demonstration interesting and informative. Next time you're using your phone or your computer, Give some thought to its ancestor, the ENIAC, and wish it a happy 75th birthday.